No. So we saw this fourth degree ODE, and we spent most of our time solving the linear system that we created from the initial conditions. And just to review quickly, we had these four linear equations and four unknowns, and then we used matrices to find the B values there at the bottom right. Eventually we found them. There's two places I said you could check. You probably should, if you have enough time, check that we actually solved the original four equations. So that would be the first place to check, and that should be a straightforward quick check. Like I'll do the first equation right there. It basically says B1 plus B2 plus B3 should equal three. So B1 plus B2 plus B3 does indeed equal three. So you can usually check linear equations super fast. So you said you wouldn't have this on a quiz, but you, would you have this on a, like a midterm? Because this took us like about an hour, which is probably about a I think before. if I put a question where there's a linear algebra problem, I'd probably limit it to three equations, three unknowns. I think that's reasonable. On a midterm or on a quiz? Yes. Okay, perfect. You can, yeah, I think when there's three equations, three unknowns, it's more reasonable to not use a matrix. When you hit four, if, if I just use like elimination or substitution, the problem is you start to have like, you're just writing more and more equations as you go, and at some point you're gonna have like 32 equations on your page, and oh, you're gonna, this way, when you use a matrix, you always have four on each step. You don't create new equations. You're, you're transforming the originals into four equivalent equations. And so it always keeps, it keeps everything nice. Whereas when you just start doing elimination or substitution, you just start writing. It's kind of like if you just wrote a different sentence like in a random spot on your paper, instead of writing paragraphs and all that. It's, that's how I view it. Yeah, whereas we're writing paragraphs now, like each, each matrix is a paragraph, and you can follow the story along very easily if you know how uh, row operations. Uh, whereas if you just look at somebody's elimination work, it just looks crazy, like they're writing a manifesto <laughs> to nobody. <laughs> a math manifesto. I mean, if somebody doesn't know what they're looking at, this looks insane too, but we all hopefully at this point know what we're looking at. So this makes perfect sense to us. All right, so we're gonna go to complex roots now. <coughs> and we'll start over with that uh, characteristic polynomial. So this is 20D. Let's get zoomed away in. So we took care of all types of real roots, both uh, non-repeated real roots and repeated real roots. So now we're going into complex roots. We have our characteristic equation. So this pretty much all section uh, homework four, or like that section is pretty much all like section twenty, and then like a little bit of the other section. So section twenty. So whatever whatever it says on on that homework section, it should say the section numbers on it. So whatever's in there is what's included. I don't know exactly what's broken down. Textbook's right there. It'll tell you what's. Well, I'm just saying, like, we started this section 20 long time ago. We've been, we're, we've been in 20 for a while. Absolutely. All right, so we have a characteristic equation. It's a polynomial in M. So if I'm writing an nth degree polynomial in M, it's AM times m to the n, a n minus one, m to the n minus one, plus a one m plus a zero equals zero. So our m values are all the solutions to this. <coughs> so if you remember, there was a conjugate pairs theorem for polynomials with real coefficients. And it says if your coefficients are real, meaning they're not complex, if you have one complex root, you have to have the conjugate complex root. So that was a complex root or a complex pair theorem. So complex roots occur in conjugate pairs. 
and that's true whenever your coefficients are real. And our coefficients will be very real. So if m equals, I really don't want to use this letter, but your book does, and it'll match everything we wrote in the past. So if m is a plus ib, the reason I don't want to use a is because I'm using a with subscripts to be all the coefficients up in my original uh, polynomial. So. But they mean something different? Yeah. Okay. So this a that I just wrote down has no subscript. So it's not really related to the other a's. Uh, so if m, if this is a solution, then m a plus i b bar, which is a minus i b, is also a solution. So they occur in pairs. So if a plus i b is a solution, a minus i b is also a solution. So let's <coughs> just naively plug in the yc, which is, oh geez, I think I was even using b's for the coefficients, wow. All right, so this will be very unfortunate. I think the book actually uses alpha plus i and beta. Oh, let's go with that, that's way better. So we're gonna go alphas and betas for the complex coefficients. All right, so what I'm using is, I think we went B1E to the MX. This is, that's what our solutions look like. It's basically sums of B1 times E to the MX. It's that linear combination of these. That was how our solution was uh, created. So all I'm doing is writing down our two M values right here. So we'll call that guy M1 and the other one will be M2. So it's B1E to the M1X plus B2E to the M2X. That's a linear combination of our solutions written like that. And now I'm just writing in the actual M1, M2 values. I didn't do anything fancy here. That's just using that formula we had before. Now we're going to factor it out. Isn't that second one supposed to be a beta? Yes. Uh, now I'm going to distribute my x like this right here. So we're going to get b1e to the alpha x plus i beta x plus b2 e to the alpha x minus i beta x. So now we're going to use the exponential algebraic property. We got e to the ax times e to the i beta x plus b2 e to the alpha x e to the negative i beta x. So any algebra questions on what I did here? And there should be pretty much algebra 2 stuff right here. What can I factor out? There's one term I can do. E to the alpha x. That's in common. Factor it out. There's other things that are similar, but that's the only thing I can factor out immediately. What about e to the Why can I not factor the e to the i beta x out? Because one of them is negative. So I can't really factor it out. Can you just multiply by negative one or something? No, there's one number you can multiply by, and it's not negative one. 
positive 1. So if you just multiply this term, if I multiply that exponent by negative 1, I don't know what I'm doing, but it's certainly not algebra. No, so I mean, like, if you have factor it out, then it would just be e to the minus 1, and then you still get e to the negative i beta x since you're multiplying. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe I got confused by something. I can add i beta x and then subtract i beta x. So I'd have e to the i beta x minus 2 e to the i. So I could make this substitution. So that's true. So I can make this substitution. And then this is e to the i beta x uh, times e to the negative 2 i beta x. So I could make that substitution. And then I can factor out e to the i beta x and have this other term left over. Yeah. But that may, that's the, I'm not sure exactly what you're describing, but it's the only thing I can think of that's similar. Do you have e to the beta x times e to the negative 1? Oh, sorry, e to the i beta x times Yeah. when you factor but how do you get the 1 out of there? This is e to the i beta x. I think what he's trying to do is how when you have like e to the i plus b, you could have e to the i, e to the b, but you can't do that with multiplication. That's only with the exponents added together. Oh. Yeah, there's no, you can't factor out the negative sign. Gotcha. It's already, so it works like this right here. So it's not a minus, it's not a subtract one, it's a multiply by negative one. So you could do that algebra I have at the kind of top of the screen right there. So you can factor it out, but you're going to be left with a term that's basically e to the negative 2 ibx. So you can't factor it out properly. Uh, however, we're going to do something completely different. So... We are going to go back to an identity we looked at a while ago. <coughs> so let's forget about all this stuff. It's not the route we're going to go. So we spent a while doing some complex identities. So let's look back and hopefully this is back in 18. What I want is this right here and this right there. The only difference is z is, what do we have? z is beta x. That's the only difference. So what we're about to do is use this where we have z is going to now be beta x. And I think we have r's look like e to the i beta x or e to the negative i beta x. So all we're going to do is use these identities and replace z by beta x. So does that make sense? So we're just using these identities right here. E1, <coughs> so let me write, I'll write that identity that we're about to use. So E to the I beta X is cos beta X plus I sine beta X. And then E to the negative I beta X is really similar. It just has a negative in front of the sign. So this goes cos beta x minus i sine beta x. And that came from the fact that uh, cosine was even and sine was odd. That's why that negative comes through the sine function and doesn't appear in the cosine function. But we went through that uh, last week when we did these identities. All right, so I'm just using these now. 
that first equation is supposed to be e i beta x, right? E i, yeah. From, from when you say from um, on the left of the equal sign. Yeah. The equation. That's what that says. Oh, there you go. You want me to make the tail a little longer? <laughs> I didn't know, I guess, by your differences between your betas and your b's. There aren't any b's around. I mean, there's lowercase b's. You could write a beta as a capital B, if that works better for you. It's pretty much a capital B. The only difference is that part is rounded at the top. That's really, And then there's a tiny little extension on the foot. That's the difference of a beta to a B. All right, so let's use these identities, B1 cos beta x plus I sine beta x plus B2 cos beta x minus I sine beta x. Okay. So things are getting worse. Hopefully they'll get better soon. Uh, so I see some things are common. So this is good. Cos beta x, cos beta x. So let's distribute b1 and b2 and then combine things together. So I collect these terms together. There's another set of terms that are the same. Sine beta x, also the same. So we're going to distribute our b and then reorganize so we can group by these terms. So I got b1 cos beta x. Ooh, that's a bad beta. Cos beta x plus b2 cos beta x plus b1 i sine beta x minus b2 i sine beta x. I also rearrange the terms. I want to collect the sines and the cosines separately. So the first factoring I'm going to do, there's cos beta x in both places. So it's b1 plus b2 cos beta x plus b1 minus b2 i sine beta x. So what we have is a new form. We got b1 plus b2. So add two constants, you get a new constant. And subtract two constants, you get a different constant. So we're just going to rename those two constants right there. So those constants we'll call the first one will be c1 cos beta x. And the second one we'll call c2 i sine beta x. Now if you allow C2 to be uh, complex, you could technically say C2 uh, C2, yeah. So let's just call this just C2. So we got C1 is B1 plus B2 and C2 will be I times B1 minus B2. So T C2 is actually going to be a complex coefficient and C1 will be a real coefficient. Alright, so we change the form around. So it's basically the sum of two uh, of a linear combination of cosine and sine. It's technically a complex linear combination because that second constant is complex variable, not a real one. Alright, so let's get into some more algebra we're going to reduce this even further. So this is one option for your, uh, the way to write your solution when you have complex roots.
So we're going to start with C1 cos beta x plus C2 sine beta x. So I'm going to do some weird algebra that won't make any sense for a minute. First of all, are these equal? So they're equal. If you just distribute that square root, it'll cancel your fractions out. Now, why did I write it? It's a different story, but it's equal. All right, so what in the world are we doing here? Let's figure this out. Uh, let's look at a triangle. A right triangle where we're going to have C1 and C2, actually C2, C1, a right angle. Now, this angle inside the triangle I'm going to call delta. What is the third side of this right triangle? Yeah, so it's the square, it's the sum of the squares of the other two sides. Yeah, if you ever read old old math books, they are, they literally write things out like I just said. They don't actually have equations, so it'll be like the sum of the squares of the other two sides. Or the, the square root of the sum of the squares of the other two sides. Um, Alright, so we have this triangle that I just created. Uh, what is sine delta in this triangle? There we go. So it should be a C1 opposite over hypotenuse. And what is cosine delta? Maybe C2 over that stuff, over hypotenuse. All right, so that's sine delta and cosine delta. Oh, look at that. We can replace that weird coefficient with sine delta, the other weird coefficient with cosine delta. So that's what we're going to do next. So we have sine delta, cos beta x, plus cos delta sine beta x. Is there any reason to choose the delta on that side? If you choose it on the other one, the sine delta and cosine delta would be close to it? Yeah, so here's the trigonometry answer to your question. Uh, delta, so let's call the other one epsilon. I'll just grab another Greek letter. Uh, basically in here, delta will equal pi, I think it'll be pi over two minus epsilon. Yeah, or if you, and it maybe a better way to see it is delta plus epsilon is pi over two. Your triangle sum is pi, so we already have a pi over two, so the other two add up to pi over two. So uh, I went with a uh, sine delta would be the same as sine pi over 2 minus epsilon. And we have a trig identity that says this is cosine epsilon. So you could definitely grab the other angle, and it will just change. The, it's just basically renaming the angle to be pi over 2 minus the angle you're thinking of. So if my angle is pi over 6, your angle would be 
two pi over six, basically. It would be the complement's not the right word, but sort of the complement of that angle. I guess my question is, you know, you're already messing up if you ended up with two cosine terms plus two sine terms together. So, so if if I had this triangle and my delta was pi over six, and you wanted to use that epsilon, you can totally use it. Your epsilon would be pi over uh, two pi over six, and your cosine of, of your angle would be equal to sine of my angle. So it would come out to be the same thing. Which also means, if you follow this procedure, you can't really screw it up. Um, in the sense of, as long as you draw your triangle out and pick not the right angle to be the angle that you're using, you're okay. So as long as you don't grab the right angle. Now I also arbitrarily, the other thing is I arbitrarily pick C1 and C2. I could swap them, which are the same effect of swapping the angle. So these are all choices and they all, as long as you carefully choose them, you'll be okay either way. So you don't have to worry about that is what I'm saying. Uh, initial conditions will determine these constants that I'm just kind of throwing around. Uh, <coughs> now is a good time to talk about constants. Uh, the constants really are delta and beta at this point. Those are the two constants right here. Uh, there is a number in front right there, but that's just you could distribute that and then it would turn into basically that would be your first constant and then that square root times cos delta would be your second constant right there. All right, so we are actually looking at the sum formula for sine. So I know we're reaching way back into the good old days of pre-calculus class. So this is sine A cos B plus cos A sine B. So this is sine of delta plus beta x. It's the sum formula for the sine function. So we can use this form right here. So I'm going to put a box around all the useful forms that we've uh, gotten to. Actually, we're going to change forms one more time, and then I'll come back and put a box around the different useful forms. Um, and I am pretty open to whatever of the forms that I put a box around that you use. So depending, there may be some web our problems that say, give me this form, like give me a function of sine, in which case this is what you use. If they say, give me a function of cosine, we're going to use the other version that we're going to look at in a minute. All right, so let's re So actually, I think we're going to recreate the triangle, but I'm going to swap C1 and C2. Yes. So same Pythagorean theorem gives the same hypotenuse. It would have the same effect as if I just drew delta at the top right corner instead of the bottom left corner. Not a toy. All right, so we're going to look at, let's see, we need to jump back to this right here because we're going to make swaps for the C1 over that hypotenuse and the C2 over the other hypotenuse. So let's write out the sine delta and cosine delta. So you know how to write the sine and cosine delta, so write them out right now. So 
I'm going to copy the form above here. Let's see if they'll let me right click. No. Nice, oh, I gotta rewrite it all. Yeah, but that will. I need a second copy of it. I could connect a mouse, but that's a lot of work. It's probably faster to rewrite. Squared. I'll be a little lazy and just write square root. We know what's inside the square roots. All right, so our first, our C1 over the square root is cos delta, cos beta x, and the C2 over the square root is sine delta, All right, so what we're looking at here is the sum formula, no, the difference formula for cosine. So this is cos A, cos B plus sine A, sine B. So this is the difference formula for cosine. So it's cos delta minus beta x. So let's summarize all these. I'm going to change the order around here. So it's C1 squared plus C2 squared. Cosine is an even function. So I can multiply the input by negative 1, making my beta x positive and my delta negative. So I'm going to write as beta x minus delta. And up above in the sine version, I'm going to swap the order. Sine is not an even function. However, addition is commutative, which lets me change the order in this form. So we got sine beta x plus delta. All right, so let's circle the useful forms. One, two. So the sine and the cosine are useful. And the, let's see. Original split form, and we'll go with one of the less messy forms at the top. I think that form is probably the best up there. So I'm going to summarize all those four that I put a box around. And you can use any of them if you're answering a quiz or a midterm, and if you're answering web work, they may be more specific, like give me a function of sine, give me a function of cosine, and in which case you pick their form. Oh yeah, no, I'm going to rewrite them all right now. Oh. So four equivalent versions. So I'll write them in the order in that we derive them, C1e to the alpha plus beta x plus i. Oh, the x is factored out, so it's i beta x plus c2e alpha minus i beta x. Next option, e to the alpha x times c1 cos beta x plus c2 sine beta x. Now both of these forms, c1 is real, c2 is complex. Oh no, that's only true for the second one. 
Uh, the first one, every uh, C1 and C2 are both real. So now I'm just relabeling that square root constant as just C e to the AX times sine beta X plus delta. Alright, so you can use whichever form is most convenient at the time. So we're going to solve a relatively, well it's going to be a only degree 2, but it's obviously better have complex solutions, not real solutions. So we're going to solve y double prime minus 2y prime plus 2y equals 0. What is the very first step on any linear ODE with constant coefficients? Same first step on the last three or four problems we did. Make y equal to e to the mx. Yep. Let y equal e to the mx, and then take as many derivatives as you need. We only need two. Plug it in. Figure out your m values. They better be complex conjugates now. So I'm going to give you about three minutes to find the two m values and choose whatever form you want. Actually, let's go with the uh, sine form right there, just so we're all on the same page. Well, we'll do the, the first and the third, so I'll write them in two different versions.
Any algebra questions on getting in? I want to complete the square. You may go on quadratic. Um, if you can factor this, that's awesome. If, if I factored this straight out, it would look like m minus 1 minus i times m plus 1 minus So if you were a factor champion, that's what the factoring would look like. So you really need to be a champion in factoring in order to see that work out, in my opinion. <coughs> so I recommend completing the square or quadratic formula. Those are the universal solutions for quadratics. Factoring only works if you're a factory champion or if the numbers are easy, like one and two but when they're complex, at least it's not easy for me to see that they were going to be like this. All right, so we got 1 minus i and 1 plus i. So you, they should occur in pairs. So if you, you should get a minus you know, bi and a plus bi. All right, these are our alpha is 1. Now, beta can be 1 or negative 1. It doesn't matter which of the two you pick. So I'm just going to go positive. positive yes, it, because it just depends on if, you know, if I said, oh, look, here's beta's negative one, or if I choose the other one, beta's positive one. doesn't matter. Uh, so if I go with the first option, I get yc equals c1e to the 1 minus ix plus C2E to the 1 plus I X. So that's the first version. Now we'll do the second version. Well, how many constants do we actually have in our, in the YC that I just wrote? How many actual constants are in here? There's a lot of variables. Two. There's just two. What two are they? C1 and, C2. C1 and C2. So our constants are C1 and C2. And what would I need to figure out their values? Initial conditions, I would need two of them. All right, we're just going to write down that uh, third option. I could write down other ones, but I'm just going to write the third one. C. E, now A, it says A, but it should be an alpha, E to the alpha, which is 1x. This is times cosine of, oops, we're doing sine, sine of beta x, beta is 1, so it's 1x plus delta. I'm just going to write it without the ones everywhere. C e to the x times sine of x plus delta. All right, how many constants are in this form? 
There are two. There better be two, or else something went wrong. There shouldn't be three or one. We still had a degree two. Would it would be nice if there was just one. No. That would not be nice. No. Because we had a second degree, so we should have two constants. The constants should match your degree. All right, what are the constants? One of them is really obvious. C and delta. C and delta. So the C should be really obvious, but the delta is a little tricky. But I get rid of the delta, or I get the value of the delta by an uh, initial condition. All right, so those constants are random. They look random up here. The constants, the delta and the C, or the other delta and the other C. Uh, those are the constants in the second two forms.